Good morning. So uh, raise your hand if you're a human being. <laughs> homo sapiens? Any homo sapiens? Great. A lot of homo sapiens in the audience. OK, raise your hand if you're about to become obsolete or irrelevant. Fewer hands. But I know you're being timid because we've all heard this story, right? We are all about to become obsolete or irrelevant. And if not us, then certainly our children. No amount of coding camp will help. Travel soccer, definitely not. OK? Um, algorithms have already defeated the best among us in chess, in Jeopardy, and most recently in the famously challenging and subtle game of Go. We have robot bartenders on cruise ships. In Thailand, they have robot food tasters. And in Saudi Arabia, yes, robot camel jockeys. So in short, algorithms are doing work so well and doing work performed by humans so well that pretty soon there won't be anything left for us to do. OK, that's the story. There's another story that you've probably heard, which is that we're on the cusp of a great singularity. Humans transcend biology. As the algorithmic frontier moves forward, we will all become man-machine cyborgs. Every one of us, an iron man or an iron woman, living indefinitely. So what will it be for us? This utopian singularity or a dystopian world without work? The story that I want to tell today and the story that I believe reflects the actual flow of history not just going back decades, but going back centuries and millennia, is neither of these. The story I want to tell is, yes, algorithms and data-enabled machines are advancing and becoming more powerful at an exponential rate. And no, we will not be working in the same way in 20 years, 10 years, or even five years as we are today. But as the comparative advantage of machine over man continues to grow in many areas of work, the human advantage will persist and endure indefinitely in others. In my story, the answer to the question, what can humans do better than digital computers, is pretty simple. The humans are better at being human. Which, of course, leads to the question, what does it mean to be human? And that is the question we have to answer. Now, it turns out that humans and tools, machines, have been co-evolving for as long as we've been humans. Our hominin ancestors, two million years ago, had the idea to cut into meat and pound at tubers like yams before eating them. Now, what this did was to sort of pre-digest the food. It was like we outsourced part of our digestive system. And because sticks, literal sticks and stones, were doing work for us, we could do other work. And the other work that we did was to grow our, relative to other animals, large and in particular densely interconnected brains. So what this first production process did, this first recipe did, was literally make us the species that we are today, for better and for worse. In my book, The Code Economy of 40,000 Year History, I refer to the evolution of human societies from simplicity to complexity over the span of millennia as the advance of code. Now, my use of the word code requires some explanation. Uh, when we think about code in the context of the future of work or the past of work, we tend to default to thinking about computer code, digital code. Uh, and that's certainly relevant in the story I'm telling today. Um, we can think about legal codes, cryptologic codes, building codes, a lot of different versions of code. But the, the version of the word code, the meaning of the word code, that is of greatest relevance to my talk today is actually genetic code, DNA. And the question that I pose is essentially, what is, if we take this evolutionary notion of human societies and the economy, what is the analog to DNA in human societies? And my answer is, that the analog is production processes. It's how we take inputs and convert them into outputs, ideas into things, ingredients into meals, literally recipes. 
So staying with literal culinary recipes for a moment, consider this Sumerian tablet dating from 3500 BC, the first known recipe book. In case you're curious, it contains recipes for 25 stews, 22 meat stews, three vegetarian. What the existence of this cookbook tells us is that we have not only been inventing new recipes, but we've been writing them down, encoding them, sharing, with, sharing them with other people for 5,000 years. Now consider this further astonishing fact. In those 5,000 years, about 100 billion people have been alive. That's four quadrillion meals prepared in some manner or another and consumed over 5,000 years. With more or less the same, in fact, due to monoculture and large-scale agriculture, a shrinking set of ingredients. So our creativity has been sufficient that over 5,000 years, we can not only come up with new recipes, but it's possible to not just survive, but prosper in our society by inventing new recipes and sharing them with other people, as the story of Julia Child so clearly attests. Now, I refer to 40,000 years as, as, as my reference point for uh, the advance of code because the first complex multi-stage production process that, that archaeologists have documented is the production of obsidian axes in the upper Paleolithic era about 40,000 years ago. Subsequently, in the Neolithic era, about 10,000 years ago, we built enormous monuments of stone that required semi-permanent encampments for their construction and maintenance. One of these encampments developed into humanity's first city, Chetelhuic, in modern-day Turkey. As famed urbanist Jane Jacobs wrote in her book, The Economy of Cities, agriculture and cities evolved together, developed together. Ideas and seeds hybridized together. And code became trades, guild-protected trades, that were so stable over time that they became family names, Baker, Barker, Smith, or Eisenhower, which means iron worker. In the 20th century, production by small-scale tradesmen, craftsmen, family farmers, began to be overtaken by large, complex, firms. Society invented a new way to organize work, the job. Now, admittedly, there were large-scale organizations before the 20th century, notably the British East India Company. And there might have been versions of something like what we would call a job today. But it was really only in the last hundred years that we had fixed roles specific subroutines within subroutines within large organizations, unions, pensions, all of the things that we think about as a job were just in the last hundred years, a blink in human history. In the last 40 years, in the United States and other advanced industrialized country, uh, countries, another epochal change took place as manufacturing firms became increasingly efficient as a consequence of both algorithms and robots, as well as improved production processes, management, it was possible to produce the output consumed in society with far fewer people than had been the case in the past. The society shifted to services. It turns out that data on word frequencies from Google Engram Google's Ngram tool, show that the phrases, have a nice day and may I help you, emerged into common parlance at the same time that the economy shifted from manufacturing to services. Now, in the last 10 or 15 years, these mechanistic scripted versions of the service economy have began slowly to yield to a more fluid theatrical version of the Apple Store or of Harry Potter World. We are ostensibly 
in the age of the experience economy. Corporations around the world are now talking about not providing goods and services to their customers, but to create experiences. So that, roughly speaking, uh, is where we are today. So where are we going? Um, before I conclude, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. It's going to take about 45 seconds, maybe a minute, and it's going to require some work. So you guys ready? I'm going to ask you to stand up. Everybody has to stand up first, unless you can't, which is fine. We're going to have to sort of lean in. Stand up. Stand up. Everybody stand up. And find one person, exactly one person. If you don't have a person, that's OK. Uh, but try to find exactly one person and hold their hand for one moment. Just one person to be your partner. OK? Turn around if you don't have a person. Just one. It can only be one. It's got to only be one person, so you've got to turn around and find somebody. This is the tricky part. Find one person. One person. OK? Now, now I'm going to count to three. Listen up, you've got to have your one person. I'm going to count to three, and at three, I want you to look into that person's eyes for five seconds. Do not look away, do not blink. OK, just five seconds, all right? On the count of three. One, two, three. All right. I love that. I love watching you guys do that. All right. OK, so, so, so how did that feel? Why did I ask you to do that? OK, you can sit down now. Thank you. <sighs> Getting back to where I started, what does it mean to be human? Right? To be human is to, to create, to collaborate, to share. We know that from the archaeological and anthropological record. We are a social species. Uh, biologist E.O. Wilson wrote in his book, The Social Conquest of Earth, that it was group selection, not selfish genes, that propelled our species forward over the span of millennia. To be human is to create and share meals. The end of the festival of Ramadan, Diwali, Passover dinner, Easter Sunday, festivals, meals. Recipes and our humanity are deeply intertwined. To be human is to share of our creativity and passions with other people. Knitting circles, trading baseball cards, or like my friend Ahmad Ashkar from Northern Virginia, to create a falafel shop to benefit refugees. To be human is to do what we're doing today. But it's more. To be human is to listen, it's to console, it's to empathize. So no, you are not going to become obsolete or irrelevant, and neither are your children, because of one simple reason. Human contact can't be automated. Compassion can't be automated. And in a very real and physical sense, eye contact can't be automated. Thank you.